Hi, I'm Evan Enzer from the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project. This is Albert Foxconn, and you're listening to Firewalls Don't, Don't Stop, Stop Dragons. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Firewalls Don't Stop Dragons. Today, we have episode 322 for May 1st, 2023. Welcome to May. It's like almost kind of summer now. Cinco de Mayo is just around the corner. You got to get those margaritas all fired up. Cannot wait for that. <laughs> Any excuse for a nice margarita. But today we've got a really great interview show, and uh, I recently caught a discussion on a web conference about privacy in cars something we've talked about on the show several times and i saw that andrea amico was going to be talking and i immediately signed up uh, that's the gentleman that runs the privacy for cars uh, dot com site and uh, that we've had on the show before and can't wait to have him back on the show and that's where i met evan enzer sort of anyway and he's kind of running the show at this discussion and finally decided at that point that i should reach out to this group the uh, surveillance technology oversight project or stop uh, I've been following these guys on social media for a long time. They're doing great work. Uh, and for some reason, I hadn't attempted to engage them directly until now. So I reached out to Evan and uh, also to Albert Fox Khan, who's the founder. And lo and behold, they were both happy to come on the show. And so we've got a little panel discussion interview for you today with these two excellent gentlemen. And we're going to be talking about mass surveillance. And it's important to understand that we're talking about mass surveillance here, not targeted surveillance, not warrant-based surveillance. You know, warrant-based surveillance, that's, that's in the Constitution. That's the, that's the bargain we agreed to. That's the balance we struck, you know, the balance between our right to free speech and free expression and privacy, you know, versus the, you know, situational abrogation of those rights requiring judicial oversight and highly targeted search warrants and things like that. That's the, you know, the check and balance. That's the thing that we kind of agreed to where in some cases it's <laughs> literally warranted but mass surveillance is a whole different ball game i mean that is that's a very different beast and and we need to understand clearly the distinction between those two situations and why mass surveillance and is getting out of hand and there's so much technology now that is allowing it to happen and some of it's commercial, not just, you know, deployed by law enforcement agencies and things like that. But a lot of it is commercial. We are surveilling ourselves. So we're going to get into all that today. And just as a side note, uh, somebody references this in the interview, I believe. And I have certainly talked about it before. If you have not seen the movie Minority Report with Tom Cruise, you should definitely check out that movie. It's got a lot of really interesting and poignant thoughts about a mass surveillance state, basically and the loss of privacy due to technological advances in the future. And, you know, it's a, also a pretty good action thriller movie, sci-fi movie, if you're into that kind of thing. But uh, it also has some great commentary along the way about a mass surveillance state. So anyway, if you haven't seen it, check it out. Anyway, I don't want to wait any longer. This was a really excellent interview and so glad we finally got these guys on the show. So let's get right to it. Albert Foxconn is the Surveillance Technology Oversight Projects, or STOPS, founder and executive director. He's also a practitioner in residence at the NYU Law School's Information Law Institute and a fellow at Yale Law School's Information Society Project, Ashoka and Ted. Wow, it's a lot of stuff. Welcome to the show, Albert. Thank you so much for having me. And Evan. Evan is a policy and privacy professional and a fellow with the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project. He likes to say that he is a house and techno DJ turned housing and tech policy guy. Uh, and welcome to you, Evan. I thought this was a Dungeons and Dragons podcast, but I hear we're talking about <laughs> surveillance, so this is even better. You can put your D20s away. We won't be using those today. That's disappointing. <laughs> it, well, well, hey, if you want to hang out after, I, I'm all down for that. Uh, but uh, not not during the interview, at least. Though I do have uh, D20 Challenge coins, if you're interested. We could talk about that later. Uh, okay, so uh, Evan, I met you or E met you on a conference uh, not too long ago. And I thought, oh, man, I, I really should invite these guys on the show because I haven't had you guys before. And so I'm really psyched about this and, and the work you guys are doing. So let's get a little background. Albert, when and why did you found the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project? And you know, maybe rattle off what are some of the accomplishments that you're most proud of? Well, I, I founded STOP in 2019, and there are a bunch of reasons why I did it, but the biggest one is I'm a giant nerd. <laughs> um, so basically growing up, my hobbies were building computers and you know protesting the NYPD. And so 
back then I would go to protests. I'd see police surveilling us. I'd see all the different camcorders. They were really bulky back Mm. then when they were monitoring dissent. And it really planted the seed about the danger of the technology that police use to watch us all. And after a ill-fated adventure into corporate law, the, the only time when when my, my class alignment hasn't been on the good side, <laughs> I, 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 I started working uh, at, at a Muslim civil rights group. And then after working there for two and a half years under the Trump administration, seeing you know FBI SWAT teams breaking down my client's doors, mm-hmm. seeing people facing arrest and deportation because of mass surveillance, oftentimes racialized, discriminatory mass surveillance. I founded STOP with the goal of taking on the surveillance state at the state and local level. And so we've grown in the four plus years since then to you know, have a, a lot of lawsuits against the NYPD. Now I don't just protest them, I, I see them in court. We have a growing number of research reports about the emerging technologies that track us all. Mm-hmm. We have a lot of coalition work where we are building these really powerful coalitions that just draw from every corner of civil society to push back against the technologies that are undermining democracy. And we have a lot of work that we do in the media trying to reshape the surveillance narrative highlighting how this isn't a choice between you know public safety and the constitution this is a choice between whether we want to be ripped off by surveillance vendors or actually uh focus on uh solutions that really work and so you know and evan is part of our our legal team part of our research team doing a lot of work to to make those sorts of campaigns possible and Evan, so what brought you to stop? What, how did you get involved there? And what is, we talked a little bit about your role here, but give us a little bit more. What, what are you doing there? Well, after working for a few years in affordable housing, I decided to go to law school in 2018. That's where I first learned about tech policy, I believe, through a, a podcast I heard with a data journalist named Meredith Bruchard. Hmm. Um, she was essentially talking about that technology isn't always designed with the needs of diverse people in mind. Hmm. From there, I took every opportunity I could to work on tech policy issues. And when I graduated, UC Berkeley, where I went to law school, was kind enough to fund some of my work with STOP. So that's how I got my foot through the door. I was doing a lot of the more in-depth research and writing projects. I wrote a report on car surveillance. I believe you're familiar with, Carrie. Yes. And since then, my work has really gone into all parts of STOP work in the legal team and increasingly on the development and communication side. All right. Well, we've got a lot of topics that we could fill three hours, but I gotta, I'm going to try to get us down, keep it into one and cover some of the highlights here. So to help educate the audience, what are some of the surveillance technologies that are most commonly used today by law enforcement agencies in U.S. cities? Well, we always have to caveat this sort of question by saying we don't know all of the technologies that law enforcement <laughs> are using. And quite frankly, Though, Which is part of the problem. Yeah, yeah, and that's often what keeps me up at night. Not the ones we know about, but the ones that we haven't heard about yet. Mm-hmm. But the ones we know about are scary enough as they is. We see increasing use of biometric surveillance, like facial recognition, which uses you know elements of our body as a tracking device. It's technology that can be incredibly invasive, that can be used to monitor our movements over large distances. That's already falsely accusing people of crimes they didn't commit and getting them wrongly arrested. We see uh, police use of social media monitoring, where large data sets are crawled through dubious keyword filtering and Mm. AI processes like natural language processing to try to identify who's going to commit a crime in the future. Uh, It's really minority report style policing becoming a reality. And then we see all of the ways that our vehicles are tracked, whether it's automated license plate readers that, you know, encircle, you know, the entirety of New York City. You can't drive into or out of Manhattan without having your location being tracked. And Hmm. increasingly, the reality in cities across America is that there's a persistent log of wherever we drive, wherever we go. It, It can be used to reconstruct our most intimate moments. Uh, And then we also see more and more ways that our smartphones are being commandeered as tracking tools by the government. The apps we install creating databases that can be, you know, subpoenaed by police to gain insights into our our lives. 
And and so really part of what we're so concerned about is that the legal infrastructure that exists today gives police far more power than they ever have in human history to track us, to watch us, to reconstruct our lives, and to do this with complete impunity. Well, one of the technologies that I've talked about stingrays and license plates readers on this show before at various times, but one of the ones that I haven't got a chance to cover and I know you guys know about is ShotSpotter. Tell us a little bit about what that is, how it works, and maybe what some of the problems are with that technology. So ShotSpotter is essentially a network of microphones that is that are um, placed all around the city that are constantly recording and looking for noises that they then analyze to see if they can classify them as gunshots. One of the big problems with this is, is that it will often misclassify other sounds like mm. a car backfiring or some sort of loud noise as a gunshot and then deploy police officers to that area thinking there's some sort of violent crime occurring mm. when actually it's just a, a car malfunctioning. Another huge problem with this is that they're often placed in majority black areas, just sort of entrenching the legacy of biased policing that we've mm. seen throughout American history. And are these microphones recording at all times? Like, is it is it picking up conversations and things as well? Like, could these are, are these things recorded and could be listened to later? Or is it strictly, is it more like a, a smart speaker where it's listening for the, hey, whatever, you know, the, the you know, it's a listening for a very distinct, you know, audio pattern before it does anything? Well, the way the technology works, you can't magically hear when the sound is that you're looking for it and to actually analyze the incoming sound patterns to see if it supposedly matches a gunshot you have to basically be listening 24 hours a day seven days a week and so what shots fire claims is that they're routinely throwing out the the recordings when they don't hear a trigger sound hmm. but what that means is in order to do that you have to be recording every nearby sound. And these are sensitive enough that they can potentially pick up conversations from inside people's homes, especially if they live near the microphone, if they have the window open. Oh, wow. And, and you know, it, what's part of what's so frustrating here is that there's so much pseudoscience in a lot of the surveillance tech. You know, according to, you know, Chicago oversight officials, you know, 90% of these are just wrong. 90% of the shot spotter activations are, are not correct. And, oh, wow. and that's because it's, you know, it's easy to say you're going to have AI magically tell the difference between a gunshot and other loud noises, but it's not that simple in practice to, you know, differentiate, you know, every loud bang and especially not to differentiate it from like fireworks and other combustion events. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, obviously the pro, you know, there's lots of pros and cons, I'm get, I'm guessing, but the pro argument for this usually it, it, that I've heard from law enforcement and others is that this increased surveillance makes it easier for law enforcement to catch criminals, at least after the fact. And maybe because if the criminals know that these technologies are deployed, may actually deter some would-be criminals in the first place. So, I mean, the appeal to security, I would think even to some degree and people maybe perhaps even in these areas where these things are deployed, may be persuaded by this. What, how, do you, how do you respond to this line of reasoning? Well, when you send heavily armed officers into communities chasing after criminals who don't exist in response to crimes that never happened, after reports of gunshots that were never fired, it's a recipe for disaster. And we've already seen people who are shot, even killed by police responding to shot spotter alerts even when there wasn't any gun at the scene. Oh, wow. And, and so I think that we know these technologies are always sold with the promise of safety, but the reality is something very different. I'd like to add to that, that while proponents of these technologies will often say that they help stop crime or prevent crime, or even help uh, catch criminals after the fact, they never actually show us any studies that show that to be true. So without, while we have, on the other hand, seen objective studies that show that the technology does not work and is a waste of taxpayer money. So I'd like to see some actual evidence that shows the effect that these technologies are having on crime before we invest in them further. Well, I think traditionally that's been a big problem around things like this is because for a couple of reasons, a lot of times I, I think law enforcement is just 
they don't want to give away their techniques and processes and stuff and and they want to be kind of keep keep it quiet and i think also sometimes they contract a lot of third party companies to do these things who claim it's proprietary information so i'm just curious i mean I mean that's that, that's been my impression from articles and things I've read. But you you guys are on the on the ground at the front lines of this. So yeah, have law enforcement agencies disclosed information about these surveillance devices to the public? You know, like who makes these things? Who are the? How much do these things cost? What are their capabilities? Like what are they actually doing? Where these things might be located? And are they under any legal op- obligation to do so? All right. Well, I'll say the answer is usually not. It, some agencies release more information than others, but in general, you need to fight tooth and nail to get any information about this technology. I'll use NYPD as an example. A few years ago, STOP actually helped pass a law called the POST Act that actually required NYPD to release some of this information and tell us what they were doing with technology. They have fought that at every turn to give us any information. And, and what is the um, reasoning? Like why, when you ask for this, what are they telling you? They will often argue two things. One, that they are complying with the POST Act, when in actuality they are not giving us anything of any value and are really misconstruing what that act is supposed to do. They say, oh, we notified you that this exists without giving us any actual information. Second, they throw every exception in the book under something called the Freedom of Information Law that to obstruct any public access to any information about policing. So I just wanted to talk about Shots Fire specifically because that's one where there's so much opacity. You know, first off, there are all these claims about the technology working, but police will make them without any evidence to back it up. But then with ShotSpotter, police won't tell the public where the microphones are. And that's in part because they claim they don't even know where the, the microphones are. ShotSpotter says that it gets to place the microphones and keep that secret from the public and from the police. That's weird. Well, they say this is a safety measure to prevent police from gaming the system, but it also makes it possible for the public to really have a say in how it's being used or to understand just how biased potentially the locations are. We saw a map from the NYPD that showed that shots fire was placed almost exclusively around public housing here in New York. But that's only because someone got a, uh, a sneak peek at that map that was never intended to be public. I can't imagine how, <laughs> how as a public service, but with public agency with taxpayer money that they can hide that. I, I, that just blows my mind. But the, one of the other things to me that I think is interesting that people don't think about either is cost. Uh, and like how much they're paying for these systems or not, because I remember when they were starting to deploy traffic cameras for red light cameras, mm-hmm. turned out the way they did that was the companies that were installing these cameras for red light tickets were getting a slice of the pie. They were getting a piece of every ticket to help fund. And I think they were actually installing the cameras either at cost or below cost to to the organization because they were, they were actually, it was a conflict of interest. They were making money for everybody they caught and issued a ticket to. So even just knowing the cost and who's installing these things is important. Do they have to release that kind of thing? A lot of the time, the full cost of surveillance is hidden from the public. So here in New York, the NYPD had a secretive arrangement with the comptroller's office, the city's top fiscal watchdog, where they hid different purchases that the NYPD labeled as special expenses. And after we fought to use the post act to get the, these documents released, we found billions of dollars in uh, secret surveillance contracts that had never seen the light of day. Mm. And in some jurisdictions, it can be even more rampant. So really a lot of the time police are using either hiding the true cost of the public or using federal funds or private donations to police foundations to really Mm -hmm. shield the public from understanding the true cost of these systems in dollars and cents. So again, these are public agencies with taxpayer dollars. (laughs) I keep coming back to that. So given, given all that, who has access to the data that is produced by these systems? And how long is that data retained? And as a citizen, do I have any legal right to know if my data has been collected? Is there any transparency around that? Well, setting aside 
state and local law for a moment. On the federal level, you really do not have many protections in that arena or many right, much right to know what data has been collected. There is something called the FTC Act, which prohibits unfair and deceptive trade practices. Mm -hmm. So that does provide at least a little bit of clarity when it comes to private collection of data, but you have much less ability to know when it comes to police or to the government. Further, once that data has been collected by a government agency, they can pretty much share it with anybody they want to. There are also some restrictions on that under something called the Privacy Act, but largely, especially when it comes to sharing information with law enforcement, it's free flowing. They can do anything they want to. So between agencies at different levels, like it could be flowing from uh, local and state to federal and vice versa? Um, that's exactly true. One of the things we're quite worried about is that you have so many jurisdictions that claim to be sanctuary jurisdictions, sanctuary cities, sanctuary states, but they still belong to these information sharing agreements that allow data to flow into the hands of ICE. So even though New York City claims we protect undocumented residents, the truth is that data collected by the NYPD routinely flows to federal partners. And you have all of these ways that the you know surveillance systems we're paying for with our dollars as New York City residents are helping deport our undocumented neighbors. And we never know how that data is being shared, how it's being accessed, and what the real harm is. So just to play devil's advocate for a second, one of the things that we learned or one of the takeaways from 9-11 was that there was not enough communication between the various agencies at the state and federal level and even within the federal government uh, that maybe could have prevented that horrible thing from occurring. So I, on some level, we do want them to share information but not too much? Well, what, what's the right way to do that? Well, one of the things that really infuriates me is the way that the legacy of 9-11 has been weaponized against, you know, the public oh, civil sure, yeah. rights. And, you know, I'm a New Yorker. I was here when that attack happened. I, If this was really a question about keeping us safe or keeping our constitution, that would keep me up at night. I wouldn't be able to do this work. But the truth is that this technology has done nothing to prevent terrorism attacks. It's being used to prosecute shoplifting, to enable deportation. It has migrated from this sort of defense against the unthinkable to the way to prosecute the mundane. And it's something that, you know, left unchecked is just going to truly transform our world into some sort of Black Mirror style parody of what we are today. Yeah. And, and to me, the other aspect of this that I try to bring to light, and I think some people miss, uh, is that, you know, so much of our economy today is driven by surveillance capitalism. If, if the product is free, then you are probably the product. So Google and Facebook and all these advertising companies that give away these quote unquote free products to because they're surveilling us and gathering this data on us. So I know that the government is also getting access to that data too. So I'm curious from your perspective, what to what degree does this third party data access intersect with our Fourth Amendment rights? Well, in my opinion, all of this third party data should be protected by our Fourth Amendment rights. Unfortunately, a lot of government agencies don't see it that way. And they do just purchase this data with no regard for the civil rights or liberties of the data subjects. You see this a lot, especially with the federal government. I believe that they're purchasing something like over 90% of the world's entire internet traffic. So they're collecting a massive amount of data with no reason to suspect that any particular one of those people are doing anything illegal. Well, I think there's some weird legal issues there. Like, like there's one, I think, literally called the third party doctrine, right? I mean, or, and, and then there's other data. Uh, one of the other things with phone data was like, well, if you leave it, if you leave it for a certain amount of time with a third party, then after that, you have no expectation of privacy. Are they using these sorts of legal loopholes to get access to this data? Or is it not even that hard? Is it just, is it just, is there just nothing in the law because we haven't thought about this for the government to go just buy this stuff in bulk from third parties? 
Yeah, the third party doctrine is one of the issues we come up against. This idea that comes from a series of cases in the 1970s where the court was looking at financial data and saying, well, you don't have a reasonable expectation to privacy and the information on your check because you know when you cash it, when other people cash it, that they'll see that data. And so we're not going to require a warrant to get it. But there's a huge world of difference from the small amount of data on the outside of a check to all of the data stored within someone's cloud storage uh, drive, mm-hmm. whether it's mm-hmm. you know all years of old uh, emails or countless hours of video or any number of other things. And so we see the court slowly coming to terms with the fact that this framework, it is built up around the scope of Fourth Amendment protection for electronic communications and other electronic records just doesn't make sense. And they started to push back on that in a couple of cases, one called Riley, where they required a warrant for accessing someone's cell phone. But then the most important one is this case called Carpenter, where they said that you can't use third-party doctrine or or similar justifications to track someone's movements without a warrant using information from the cell companies. You know, every time you use a cell phone, it's creating a location record. You, You know, police were routinely using cell site location information to track people's movements. And what this said was that you can't do that. You can't basically treat this information as unprotected just because the phone company has it, because cell phones are indispensable to modern life, and there's no real consent right. to this sort of use of that data. Well, and I and I talk about Amazon's very, very cozy relationship with law enforcement around like ring video doorbells and companies like Clearview AI, whose sole purpose is to, well, so they say, is to collect these for the quote unquote good guys this technology that allows them to take anybody's face and identify them using data scraped from social media and other places. Do you have any insights into those, maybe? But are are there any other of these kind of public-private partnerships going on that you're aware of? Well, one of the companies that we're suing is Thomson Reuters because it is collecting data from countless companies, from... uh, from different commercial databases and selling it to private customers, but to law enforcement, to ICE. And we see a lot of different companies creating this data ecosystem. You know, companies like Fog Reveal, they're another one that is selling location data to law Mm -hmm. enforcement and, and really turning our data into a policing tool and into a commodity. And so we we continue to push back on it, and, and we're trying to actually support legislation that would outlaw a lot of these police data purchases. Because right now, the police have very broad powers to seize data under the Fourth Amendment, but the courts oftentimes don't think the Fourth Amendment applies at all if they're purchasing this data on the open market rather than using the force of law. And, and to me, that creates really perverse incentives for law enforcement to use public funds to purchase away our privacy. Well, and and one more other weird legal twist that I'll bring up that I'd love to get you guys to take on is this notion of parallel construction, where a lot of times I think when these agencies are worried about either giving away their techniques and the, the secret sauce for how they are getting some of the surveillance data, or perhaps if maybe both worried about it being inadmissible in court, that they use some of this shady technology uh, or third-party data to to get data and then find another way to have gotten that data in a more traditional fashion. Do you, do you run into that a lot? Do you see that happening? That happens all of the time. And I think I'm very happy you brought it up because you will see police departments and others using technology like facial recognition or location tracking to get what they call an initial lead. But then because that lead is never presented in court, because like you said, they go through other means to find the same evidence again, after already knowing that they're going to find it. Because they do that, there's never actually a chance to challenge that initial lead in court. So you can never say, no, this wasn't me in this picture that they applied facial recognition to. The only thing you're up against is influence witness identification saying, that's the person. Yeah. 
All right. So as as I'm thinking about this, as I'm walking around or driving around in public spaces, what what expectation of privacy do I have in terms of surveillance by the public or, uh, or government institutions? How do the First and Fourth Amendments, because not just the Fourth Amendment, you know, against unreasonable searches and seizure, but if I'm, if I'm out in public, you know, organizing as I see fit with hanging with who I want to hang with, but maybe, you know, organizing with people that I don't necessarily want to be the government tracking me doing, do I have protections there? How does that, how does that play into this? Well, under the federal constitution, you're kind of out of luck. There's not a whole lot there under the current case law to protect you. But what we see is a growing number of state and local laws all across the country Mm -hmm. creating patchwork of protections against some of the most abusive forms of surveillance. We have bills pending in New York that would ban things like geofence warrants, which turn a single court order into a digital dragnet to potentially identify thousands of people in a given area. We see the bans on police data purchases. We see bans in dozens of cities and states around facial recognition. We see a growing number of uh, communities that are taking on the use of drones. So while the federal constitution has been really falling behind the pace of technological growth and the you know threat posed by these sorts of dystopian surveillance solutions, you know, in more and more parts of the country, you at least have some protections against the ways that local police, that state police can try to use this technology to, to target you. And I I don't know if this is really related to that, but just kind of to flip the script. So obviously that law enforcement agencies who are bound by duty to try to serve and protect, uh, want to do, you know, in their minds, you know, I see where they're coming from. They want to do everything they possibly can. They want to, you know, leave no stone unturned to try to protect the public. And I think we, after 9-11 in particular, we've kind of adopted this never again mindset where we don't want to ever let anything bad happen. And it, for, me, for me, that's like parents saying, I never want anything bad to happen to my kids, so I'm going to lock them in a cage in the basement. I mean, that doesn't make any sense either. But when you try to flip the script, when <laughs> when you want to try to record law enforcement, they really don't like that. Can you tell us a little bit about, first of all, is is it legal if I want to record a police officer, you know, making a traffic stop or something, if I'm worried something might go sideways, or if I feel like I'm being over surveilled or my rights are being impinged? You know, what are my rights as a citizen to record law enforcement? In general, you are allowed to record law enforcement. You are right that sometimes they will get very angry with you. And something that we see at the state level in New York is attempts to outlaw recording police officers in some way, whether it is just saying you can't record the cops or it's saying things like, digital assault of a police officer or doxing of a police officer to share their information with others. And I really worry about laws like that, that would restrict the public's ability to record police when we really need that kind of oversight. I've even seen or read articles of going so far that police are using the fact that sites like YouTube and and some of these other social media sites will automatically pull down videos that contain audio of like rock songs or pop music songs by playing that music in the background while they are doing their duties such that they (laughs) hoping that any video taking of them doing what they're doing will automatically be pulled for copyright violation from social media is that is that an urban myth or does that happen no we see it happening we see departments that have been sued for this we see departments that have issued regulations against it, because there is a clear constitutional right to record officers in public places. And when officers try to weaponize copyright law against the public to suppress their speech, to suppress you know that sort of accountability, it's something that is clearly unlawful in my mind. And so, you know, there's certainly are, are you know, some open questions about the exact parameters of this sort of legal issue, where like the world of copyright and the world of political dissent collide. But, you know, this is something that can, that really does happen. All right. I was afraid that was going to be the case. 
So who watches the watchers? What sort of oversight regimes are in place to monitor the use and potential abuse of public surveillance technology? Uh, is there anything codified that, that allows or ensures some sort of system of checks and balances with the use of this technology, either at the, the, the state, local, or federal level? Well, first, I'd, I'd like to say that we at STOP, we watch the watchers. That's, mm. that's kind of our motto. So I love that phrasing of it. There is a structure that I really that I really like called CCOPS. And this actually does not restrict law enforcement or any other government agency from using this technology. It's really at the most basic level, only saying that we do need some sort of oversight of surveillance technology. Generally, what it requires is that an agency who wants to start using new technology must send a report to the city council, and then it's up to the city council to approve or deny that proposal after a public comment period. So this provides more of that transparency and is really the, the first step to better oversight of these technologies. And where I've heard of CCOPS. Where, where is that in effect? Where, that's not a federal law, is it? Where is that applying? There are about two dozen cities and states that have some version of CCAPS at this point. And, you know, there's a real broad based push to get more jurisdictions to not just have some CCAPS laws, but to also have stronger CCAPS laws. Here in New York, our CCAPS law, the Post Act, is a transparency law, but there's now a, a big push in light of the NYPD's latest unlawful surveillance purchases to strengthen it and to actually ensure that there are additional restrictions on, on uh, some of the future purchases. But, you know, I, I have to say, as someone who wants to outlaw mass surveillance as we know it, CCOPS is invaluable because it lets us look behind the curtain at the just the scale of the mass surveillance, but it's you know, never going to be enough on its own to end surveillance as we know it. I think that's key to mention that CCOPS is a start. And we talked about all the problems with the POST Act earlier. It will never be the complete solution. Yeah. How do you find out what you do find out? I'm I'm guessing there's probably two avenues. One is probably legal, maybe through something like Freedom of, of Information Act sort of requests. Uh, which are great. At least we have that avenue. But I also, I'm guessing you guys do some regular old shoe leather kind of work too, try to do some investigative journalism kind of things. What are your techniques for trying to expose this? How do, how do you go about finding these technologies and bringing them to light? Well, there's a lot of just times talking with whistleblowers, talking to officers, talking to different tech vendors, looking at their marketing materials. A lot of the police departments are pretty tight-lipped about what they'll tell us about these technologies, mm. but the vendors are very eager to advertise them. And so <laughs> they can often give us a lot of uh, important information about how these systems operate. But, you know, we have quite a few lawsuits going on right now, and if we can go into more detail about this, fighting for records from different government departments about the technologies they have used and abused. Yeah, I'll say we do have several lawsuits right now, mostly against NYPD trying to discover how different surveillance technologies work. There's one lawsuit that we've been in litigation regarding for years now about the surveillance of Black Lives Matter protests during the summer of 2020. That one's still ongoing, and we're still trying to get that information from NYPD. We also have a few lawsuits right now about how the police department uses things like social media analysis technology to monitor people on a um, much bigger scale. I guess I'll, I'll also add that I mentioned this earlier, but it really is not an easy process to get any information from government agencies about this technology. Well, let's talk about what we can do about this, how we might respond to this as consumers and citizens. So let's start with the consumer perspective first. What advice can you give us for maybe avoiding surveillance by smart home kind of devices? I know you guys recently did a report kind of around this, but setting aside the the law enforcement for the, for the second, but knowing that a lot, of, a lot of this commercial data gets up in their hands anyway, how should we be worried about, what should we be thinking about before we load our home up 
with a, a bunch of smart devices in terms of potential mass surveillance? I'll start with this one. I had a, a hand in writing that report at Stop. And really the best solution is just not to buy technology that is going to surveil your home. A lot of the time you can find an alternative that will work just as well as whatever surveillance device you might buy. So if you're going to buy an Amazon Echo, instead of buying something that's going to wiretap your home, you could just buy a Bluetooth speaker and stream music from your phone. In my opinion, it's just as convenient. Or if you want to control the lights and have them go on and off at specific times, you can just buy a timer that will do that without any of the technology that opens your home up to things like surveillance and even to hacking. Albert, do you have any advice? I mean, these are profoundly creepy devices that every time you introduce <laughs> one into your home, it's a point of vulnerability. It's a point of vulnerability when people break the law to hack in and steal people's footage. But it's also uh, creepy when the police can use the power of law to uh, seize this data from people and to you know get a window into their own home. We, we hear about cases all the time where people have Amazon ring footage and other footage being taken against their will by police officers. And, you know, I, I always remind people that any uh, recording device you own is just one court order away from being turned into a government surveillance device. Yeah. And I mean, I've, I've heard several cases, for instance, of law enforcement re finding out that they have in the home where, or in the place where a crime has occurred, Amazon Echo products, for example, and they have subpoenaed or re requested, whatever the legal term is for in this case, re requested that Amazon turn over any recordings that were made during certain time periods. And you've already talked about Am uh, Android geofence wardens, but I've also heard of even goofier things like husband is suspected of killing his wife and, you know, says he wasn't in this location or wasn't exerting himself by stabbing her 38 times. And so they request Fitbit information to find out if his heart rate was up at the time of the murder or, you know, get location information to find out if he was near the creek where her body was found and things like that. You know, <laughs> I mean, on one hand, we, you know, these things could be used to catch killers, I guess. But uh, on the other hand, yeah, it's it is super creepy to think that all information is available for for the, for those purposes. So uh, let's let's talk about public surveillance because we talk about that a lot, and, and I'm really curious to find out what you might say here. So when I am out and about, you know, for, first of all, like when and where sh should I be worried about being recorded or monitored? Obviously, maybe at, at a political protest would be a big one, but I'm curious if you've got any other tips and tricks about when I should be more concerned or where I should be more concerned about being monitored. And then the, the kicker here is. What, if anything, other than not going to the protest or not going to these areas, can I do to kind of mitigate the chances of me being surveilled? Well, one of the things that's so hard is that oftentimes we don't have any control over whether or not we're surveilled. I, one of the things we recommend is that people avoid taking cell phones with them when they're going to sensitive locations just because of the number of ways that we can be tracked on those devices. Sometimes people will take a burner phone to a protest or another sensitive site as a way to reduce the risk. But it's really hard to properly set up a burner phone in a way that can't inadvertently be mm -hmm. traced back to you. And so I, I really think that's one of the, the important things. And also, uh, you know, people really need to be thoughtful when they go to protests about not sharing information about others without their consent. I can't count the number of times that I see people going online posting about an anti-police protest but in the process, revealing the identities of a lot of people who may not have wanted it to be so easy for the police to track them. A selfie with a crowd shot, right? Exactly. I mean, it's sort of like it, 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 at that point, you're just doing the cop's job for them and making it <laughs> so easy for them to know, you know who is there. What about things like We've just gone through COVID, so a lot of people wear masks to try to defeat maybe face facial recognition, so it wore hats. I've even seen people put on funky, like, cubist Picasso, you know, makeup jobs to try to throw off facial recognition technologies and wearing funky shirts that have faces all over them and things like that. Do you, I, I don't know, maybe that's all kind of wacky, but do you, do you, are there any OPSEC technical solutions or offbeat things like that that people might do to 
prevent themselves from being recognized and tracked? I wish they worked, but I really keep telling people <laughs> that it's always an arms race between any technology mm -hmm. that's used to defeat facial recognition and the people who are developing these algorithms. We've seen so much money go into facial recognition tech that can work even when people are wearing a mask during the pandemic. And some of them have gotten really good. And when you're thinking about this sort of as a cat and mouse game, the deck is stacked against anyone trying to come up with technology to defeat facial recognition because all you have to do if you want to, to you know, figure out who someone is when they're using, when they're wearing the serve clothing, it's wait, wait for the technology to get better, wait for the algorithm to get better. Because I guarantee that with all of those weird hats and all of those weird t-shirts we've seen with the patterns that are supposed to block at facial recognition, they're not going to last the test of time. And I think Albert said something really important. And that's that it's an arms race. And if you have something that does protect from facial recognition, there are still so many other ways that you can be identified, whether it's from the way you walk, there's mm -hmm. programs that will do that. Now, mm -hmm. if there's no camera there, maybe you drove your car there and your car has biometrics and your car knows who you are and where you drove to. And if it's not your car, maybe it's your phone. Your phone can also place you at a location. So ultimately, even if there is something you can do to block one form of surveillance and protect your privacy, there are still dozens of other ways that you can be identified. Right. Well, and the other thing too, is because storage space has become basically infinite, that storage is so cheap now that even if they can't figure it out today, they might be able to figure out next year or five years from now, if it's that important, because they've recorded it and they, they can go back and apply newer technologies to older, older data. Okay, last question before we go. How do we ultimately fix this problem? How do how do we ad ultimately, as a society, address mass surveillance? Is there, you know, can we get there via litigation that leans on existing constitutional protections? I mean, are the laws and rights basically there? We just haven't either had enough lawsuits that, 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 that refine them, or do we need actually new legislation? Do we need new laws and new regulations? Because we just, the, the current case law just doesn't keep up. Look, I'm a lawyer, but I don't think the solution <laughs> is a legal one. It's a political one. It's a question of will. It's a question of popular opposition. We're building a movement with partners across the country, across the globe, pushing back against these technologies. And I think when we look at the history of civil rights, when we look at the history of every major political battle in you know, America's past, what we see is that law can be a tool for affecting change, but must be in partnership with mass mobilization and political movements. And when I think about what we will see in the coming years is that it had to get to a breaking point where the cost of inaction was intolerable before we were actually going to see the sort of sweeping changes we needed to push back against the growth of this technology. And so I really do believe in my heart of hearts that we're going to go from a world where police get to make all of these decisions, where the courts presume they have the power to surveil us however they want, whenever they want, unless proven otherwise, to a world where they have much more circumscribed powers and where we have much more ability to use new technologies to navigate our digital lives without worrying about every choice we make being used against us in some later date. Yeah. Yeah. Evan, what do you think? What, what do you, if you could wave your magic wand, what, what, what sort of changes would you like to see made that would help us and you know, have a, have a brighter future and, and, and curb mass surveillance, you know, and replace it with what we, you know, we targeted surveillance as part of the constitution. I mean, we've, we've got, you know, when you've got certain situations, we say, okay, you can invade by privacy when you've got reasonable cause and get a warrant from a judge and that kind of thing. But, you know, mass surveillance is certainly a problem. So <laughs> do you have any thoughts about what we can do to curb mass surveillance, but without completely hampering the, the necessary functions of law enforcement? Albert said that beautifully. More specifically, I do think that 
we could do a lot through litigation to bring the Fourth Amendment back to the strength that it used to have. Before we had the digital capabilities for mass surveillance, government invasions into privacy were not absent. There were certainly a lot of surveillance laws going back to colonial times, but it wasn't possible on the scale that it is today. And the law has just not kept up to maintain those constitutional rights. So if I was going to wave a magic wand, I would say that we need new court decisions that restore the strength of the Fourth Amendment. But I'm very doubtful that that will happen just based on recent history. I think we need legislative solutions that force government agencies and courts to restore the Fourth Amendment, because I don't think it's going to happen on its own. All right, I lied. One more question. How do we how can people get involved? What what do you recommend people do? Obviously, you guys are doing great work up in New York City and a lot of the work you're doing filters outside of even New York City. So, you know, I encourage people obviously to go check out your guys' website uh and to and to donate uh, whether you live in New York City or not. Uh, in fact, I did. I just signed up. I'm now giving you guys 10 bucks a month. What else could people do? What how do people stay involved? How do people stay educated? How do they make their voices heard? Well, thank you so much for donating and thank you for just highlighting that because we are a small grassroots organization that's fighting some of the largest companies and paramilitary organizations on the planet. And so people can sign up for more information on our website, get updates, follow us on the surveillance capitalism uh, platform of their choice at uh, Stop Spying NY or uh, StopSpying.org for the web spot, website. And, and, you know, we continue to, to work on finding partners who want to take the bills that we've drafted, the lawsuits that we're filing, and replicate that in other parts of the country. So mm -hmm. please don't hesitate to, to get in touch. Um, we have a forum on the website, and we're always looking to, to broaden this coalition. Evan, what about you? Any other advice for us? Follow us on TikTok. Follow us on Twitter. Follow Albert on Twitter. He's incredibly funny there. And check out StopSpying.org for ways to get involved. Wonderful. Albert, Evan, thank you so much for coming on the show. That was a great discussion and a very, very important discussion. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Maybe next time we can talk about D&D. I would love to play D&D with those guys. And I think we were talking off air. I think Albert was actually saying he was off to a D&D game at some point soon. Uh, and I don't know if he had never played or hadn't played in many years, uh, like a lot of us haven't. A lot of us, you know, back in the day would play D&D &D the old school way with books and on paper with little figurines, you know, on tabletops. And that, you know, that's how I started. But he was off to some D&D &D game. And so we talked a lot about Dungeons and Dragons off the air. But man, that would be a fun thing to do. Maybe maybe I'll get up to New York City and we'll go have a D&D &D game together. That'd be fun. So I, I wasn't kidding. I did donate to these guys. They're doing great work. Uh, I've signed up for 10 bucks a month. You don't have to do that. But I mean, if you're interested in supporting this kind of effort, these guys are doing, of course, great work in New York City. But a lot of the stuff they're doing is spilling out into other areas of the country as well and serving as a model for other cities. So supporting what they're doing in New York City could very well help you wherever you are. Obviously, I've got links to their site in the show notes. I've also got a link to their Trojan House report. If you're interested about IoT stuff, we talked about IoT security recently. This is more about IoT privacy, and it's a really good read. You might want to check that out. You can follow them on Twitter or even TikTok if you want. That's uh, at StopSpyingNY. Check out their website, StopSpying.org. And we talked about a couple other anti-surveillance legal frameworks. We talked about the Public Oversight of Surveillance Technology, or POST Act. I believe that's New York specific but it doesn't have to be. And we also talked about the Community Control of Police Surveillance or the CCOPS laws or framework. And those have been replicated in various places around the country, as we talked about in the interview. So if you would like to, you know, look into maybe implementing those in your local area, there are frameworks, there are things that you can look to as examples that you might want to try to push your local legislators to pass so that you can get the benefit of the work that's already been done and put a curb on this warrantless mass surveillance regime that is you know, sweeping the country and the world, honestly. 
In fact, if you really want to organize a local group to, you know, advocate for privacy and other related issues, you might also want to check out the Electronic Frontier Alliance program with the EFF or the Electronic Frontier Foundation. They basically help you organize groups around these sorts of topics. And honestly, if you go to their EFA website, you, you can search to see if there's already an EFA uh, affiliated group in your area. And this interview honestly has inspired me to think about doing a panel discussion with some other groups, including the EFA from the EFF <laughs> and maybe Epic and maybe ACLU. Uh, I'll, I'll see who I can find to you know, do a panel discussion around citizen involvement and how you can create groups to effect change in your local area. So anyway, I'll see if I can't pull that together and do that as a future interview show. All right, that's going to do it for this week. Thanks for tuning in and lots of great stuff coming down the pike. So as always, I would recommend that you just subscribe to this podcast. That way you won't miss any of that great stuff. Go to firewallsdontstopdragons.com to learn more about the newsletter and the blog and find some cool dragon merch. Check out the book. Find my list of resources, which is a little bit a little bit messy. I try to keep it somewhat organized, but there's a lot of links there to other great stuff. And if you want to support the cause and become a patron, uh, we've got some great discussions going on on our Discord server. We've got some bonus podcast content that you could be consuming only for patrons. Just tons of great stuff. Check it out. Firewallsdon'tStopDragons.com or look in the show notes. All the links are there. All right, everybody, take care out there. Stay safe. And until next week, as always, don't get caught with your drawbridge down. <laughs>